Our next speaker is David Ryan. He was named Executive Director of the Salisbury Wicomico Economic Development Corporation in October of 1993. Based in Salisbury, Maryland, Salisbury Wicomico Economic Development Inc. was formed in 1968 as a public-private partnership charged with strengthening the local uh, and regional economy through the attraction, retention, and diversification of the community's economic and employment base. Dave began his work uh, career as a sales representative for the pharmaceutical firm Warner Lambert. Uh, after district, key account, and divisional assignments, he assumed the regional manager uh, northeast position in Rochester, New York. Born and raised in Salisbury, Maryland, Dave received his undergraduate degree from, in marketing and economics from Old Dominion University and his master's in business administration from Salisbury University. He serves on numerous boards and commissions and is the past president of the Maryland Economic Development Association. He lives in Salisbury uh, with his wife and his three children. Please welcome Dave Ryan. George, thank you for the introduction. And thank you for all that you do and your team at Maryland Capital Enterprises. You really do help make dreams come true without a lot of fanfare over there. And people uh, realize the ownership of their own businesses or the ability to expand businesses and sometimes the ability to keep businesses afloat. Thanks to your team's efforts over there, we're proud to be a partner and thanks for the introduction. I don't know if Ernie's with us right now, but I want to give a shout out to my friend Ernie uh, Coburn, who's uh, closer to retirement each day as we, as we move forward. Uh, I've known Ernie before the chamber, uh, during the chamber, and I trust we'll be uh, good partners and friends after the chamber. So thanks for uh, allowing us to participate in forums like this and for the, Madam President, your, your partnership with uh, SWED over the years. I thought you took the, uh, the, the trusty remote. As you can see from my first slide, this will be a very sophisticated presentation today. When I was a little kid, my parents would often drop me off to my grandmother's house. And she lived on a, it was a fairly quiet street, but it was a through street nonetheless. And across the street was a general store. And in that general store, there was an ice cream chest. It was one of those kind that you kind of slid, slid the doors open from the top. Before my parents would leave, they would give me some change and for an ice cream cone sometime during the day. And my grandmother would admonished me not to cross that, that street. And if you're playing and climbing trees and it's hot and the big shot that I was at, at eight or so, I kept looking at the house and I didn't see my grandmother and I'd look for the cars and I didn't see cars and I'd look back at the house and I didn't see my grandmother and I'd look at cars and didn't see cars and, and off I went. Only later my grandmother would come out and say, I thought I told you not to cross the street. I said, Grandma, my, I didn't cross that street. And she said, I'm going to ask you again, did you cross that street? And Grandmother, I, I didn't cross that street. I'm starting to get a little bit nervous now. She says, one more time, I told you, this is it. Did you cross that street? And I went back and forth and said, Grandma, I didn't cross that street. She then introduced me to this stool, after looking at the ice cream all over my face, and put this stool in the corner of a kitchen, and there I sat for the next 30 to 45 minutes. I don't remember today what I thought about, other than what, it, what I did to get on the stool in the first place, but I remember the stool, and it was a very sturdy stool. If you look at our lower shore economy today, healthcare is one leg, higher education is one leg, agriculture and poultry as one leg. And if we're looking at how we fare going outward from here, perhaps it's best to look at those three categories. Before we get there, let's understand the changes taking place in economic development today. I'm talking to employers and they're telling me, Dave, we're having trouble finding the right fit. We're having trouble finding the right employees or the associates to fill the spots that we have open. And I talk to job seekers and they say, Dave, I can't find meaningful work. Now what's happening in the marketplace today? Why is that so? 
You know, if we started out as a country and our community here as an agrarian or agricultural based economy, and went through an industrial revolution and information or technology age, and perhaps we're seeing a confluence or a convergence of all of those in today's economy. It's causing some disruption. It's causing some angst. It's causing some uncertainty. It's also creating some opportunity. It's our job to figure out that opportunity part and how we capitalize it as a region going forward. The model of economic development changes used to be, let's identify 300 acres, hopefully close to a municipality, so we can run roads and water and sewer lines and natural gas lines and fiber and overlay it with some type of tax credit program. And there's your economic development model. That's what we were marketing. Today, it's why Mayor Day is working so hard to create this sense of place. It's why Mr. Carver is investing in education. Because today, it's about talent. How do we attract talent to our community? How do we attract talent to our businesses? How do we attract talent to the plants or the office buildings in which we work? And if we can do that, we can create a more knowledge-based workforce, workforce with the skill sets that's demanded by industry today, and that creates wealth. And I'm not talking about monetary wealth, but wealth in terms of skills, wealth in terms of knowledge, wealth in terms of diversity, so that we can better withstand any economic cycle in which we're confronted in the near future, or the, the long term. And so that sets the stage for the rest of the presentation as we go through. And I want to touch base uh, at least a little bit on each of those sectors I, meant, I mentioned earlier. And first, the health care. We're blessed in that we're a day's drive to about a third of the nation's population in a fairly high cost area in the Northeast section. As the baby boom, boomers continue to retire, they migrate south. And the closer the, to the coast in our area, the more activity and commerce you will be seeing today. That is not likely to ebb anytime soon. I'm the last of the baby boomers in the 62 time frame, so to speak. I still have a lot of tuition to pay, so I'm not going to be retiring anytime soon. But it's too many kids. That's the problem. But, but we, don't, we, we see that continuing. Also, because of the demographics, we're, we're seeing a cluster of life sciences in our community today. Cadista, Zoetis, Trinity. That's expected to continue. But how did that happen? I think it's worth a quick, a quick narrative of how that happened. About three and a half decades ago, companies started making pills in the Northwood Industrial Park here. And they didn't make it. And the bank who had the note on the, it was a very small building and very few pieces of equipment, but the bank that had the note sent flyers up and down the East Coast saying, hey, we've got this equipment and a building for sale. One of those flyers landed on the desk of my friend Rod Chopra in Westbury, New York. And he ran a company in Westbury called Tishcon Corporation. And they made vitamins and supplements and dietary pills and things like that. So he called us up and he asked for help and we helped him. He started building his company to where it is today with about 140 people or 150 people in the Northwood Park in about 80,000 square feet. Along the way, Raj had a friend in Ohio. He said, Raj, I'm, I want to build my business too. And Raj says, well, we're having good luck with those guys in Salisbury. You ought to give them a ring. And Dawson Potty did. And he and his son Ram moved to the area and started Trinity Labs. It was a medical product manufacturing company, and we helped him. And he grew the business to 20 people, or 25 people and split it, one in the kit business. And then he started a generic pharmaceutical business called Trigen Pharmaceuticals. And he sold the kit business to a company out of Pennsylvania. And it became Trinity Sterile. And they employ about 100 people today. And he sold the Trigen business to a company out of India called Jubilant Cadista. And that's why we have six or 700 people in the life science sector today. And that's also how we will grow future industry clusters. The other leg I mentioned was higher education. Forget about the nearly 20,000 students running around our market area. 
and forget about 3,600 employees associated with this fine institution, SU, Dell Tech, and Warwick Community College. But look at the opportunities that we can see right in our own backyard. It used to be we were giving away, not in giving, that's the wrong terminology, investing about $5,000, $10,000 a year in new businesses coming out of the entrepreneurial programs at, at Salisbury University. Today it's $200,000, $250,000 every single year. I've gotten to know Dr. Bell and her team here and Dr. Alati, Dr. Cairo and Dr. Allen, just terrific opportunities within this university to commercialize technology is taking place in various labs throughout the campus. And nobody can beat Warwick, and Dell Tech's pretty good too, and training for the opportunities that exist in today's market. So the more we can reach and connect with our university systems, the better off we're gonna be. 2016, we had record production of corn and soybeans and record yields. Two thirds of the cost of raising a bird to market is feed. So 12 months out, we look at the futures on the Chicago Board of Trade of number yellow to corn, and the price is stable, maybe a little bit lower. Some risk, as Dr. Rani pointed out, of, of inflationary pressures and other inputs to the poultry industry like oil or natural gas. But for the most part, we see stability in the, in the inputs for the poultry industry. No antibiotics is driving innovation in the poultry industry a new feed formula. So if we're not put, putting vaccines or medicines, then what? what kind of formulas exist? And what kind of opportunities do we have? And innovation, not only in uh, uh, the feed, but also lighting within chicken houses, raising birds in a different way, constructing windows. All of this presents opportunity. We helped Age Pharma, a uh, high-level research company in, uh, in outside of uh, Hebron, opened up their innovation center a few months ago, and we're starting to get new agribusiness, a new traction for that. So much so, uh, there's so much opportunity that we devoted our third video in a, two, in a series of videos, two-minute videos promoting the community, and I, I guess we're gonna, we're gonna show that right now, if I may. It's two minutes, you'll enjoy it, you'll recognize some folks. Here in Delmarva, agriculture plays a, a pivotal role in everything that we do. And this community is wonderful, and the farming community on top of that, the agriculture community, has been amazing. I can do a lot from right here that 20 years ago would have been unthinkable. We like to call it a, a big garden and all, even though we do farm around 700 acres. We're in a state winery. We make over 20 different wines. H Pharma is a uh, private research company. Our primary focus is on uh, high-level animal research, but the other side of our business is product development. So we started out very small, just on this 150-acre farm right here, and have expanded over a couple thousand acres. We came uh, down here and looked at this lot, saw the playground next to it, and thought it was a way to engage our neighbors. We set up in a rural area where we're able to really be in touch with issues at the ground level. Yeah, it's gone local to global. I'd say that's probably the biggest change that we've seen in the past five to ten years. So understanding the interrelationship between all those pieces, how that works as far as it affects Purdue and how that affects the community, I think is very important to understand how the Damarba way of life really comes together. So everybody likes to know where their food is produced now. Well, Kamapo County is a great opportunity for starting a business. It's not going to work. It's just going to the farm. Every day is an interesting day. I always wanted to get back to the farm, even though I've been in commercial business for over 50 years. I don't want to be big, I just want to be good. I don't want to be the biggest, I just want to be known as the best managed and the best operator. It's a very established industry with very deep roots as far as how the commodity-based ag industries run. What that means to me coming in after my time away from Delmarva is that it's an industry ripe for disruption, it's ripe for change, and it's ripe for bringing skill sets that haven't been employed here in the past. Everybody has to eat. These are where the roots are, and this is my home. And so I have glowing, glowing things to say about all the people I've worked with in the agriculture industry in this area.
So, a little bit about the forecast. If we look at Salisbury Metropolitan Statistical Area, we're one of the fastest growing in the United States, the 42nd fastest growing MSA in the United States today. We're also the northernmost area of our country on the eastern side of the country that has that distinguished. I knew I brought this for a reason. This is a the trend for our metropolitan statistical area since 2001. These are average job counts. When I, t when I say jobs, I'm talking about jobs within the jurisdictional lines of Sussex County, Wicomico, Worcester, and Somerset. Real jobs. And you can see the black line is us the, in the uh, region. And the orange, Maryland, green, Delaware, and the blue, the, the U.S. You can clearly see the, the growth three or four times the rate of the two states in the country prior to the recession. If it felt like we're in a longer recovery, it's because we have been in a longer recovery. But a recovery nonetheless. And if it felt like in the past couple of years it's gotten better, it's because it has gotten better, even faster than the two states or the country as a whole. And these are where the jobs are increasing. And the closer you get to the coast, especially in Sussex, you're seeing the increase in leisure and hospitality jobs, not that surprising. The more inland you get, you're seeing it in the education and healthcare, not that surprising, really when we look at the demographics of our country, and I don't see that trend letting up anytime soon. And this is what employment looks since about the same period of time. And employment, when I, when I say employment, I'm talking about people living within our metropolitan statistical area that has a job. The job may be, might be within that area, might be outside that area, but people are, are employed. And out of the sequestration happening in, in uh, 2013, and as Dr. Arani, I think, very accurately mentioned, the, the defense industry, we have a, our share of defense companies here, too. And we took a little bit of a bath in, in the 2013, but we've come back pretty strong as a region. So going forward, if you look at next year, and we really see stability in the employment sector, we see a tighter labor market or the tight market continuing. So the more we can do, the more we can collaborate, the more we can connect people with jobs that we have, the more we can connect people to the training to get the skill sets that's demanded by industry today, we'll be able to lower that unemployment rate. And we can do it right in our own backyard. New businesses will be smaller, more niche oriented, very much like my Tishcon story. And I can trace a similar story of the microwave or the wireless component sector back to the founding of K&L in 1972, or poultry industry back to the founding of Purdue in 1920. They'll be more innovative. Manufacturing, we're producing more with less people. We need more talent, more skill sets. Retirees will continue. People will continue to age. And the wild cards are perhaps wind. We don't know what that looks like in Maryland next year. We don't know what the Triton project or where that might land and the 400 jobs associated with the drone through the Navy contract there. But, also, but very positive, very optimistic uh, forecast for us, um, perhaps even going against the grain uh, of Maryland because we are less dependent upon the federal government for our local economy here. So what we can do is continue to connect. Dr. Bell, I've had the pleasure of reaching out to your team and uh, throughout the university, we appreciate that. We can do that more, look no further than here. How can we connect people to those skill sets? How can we connect people to jobs? How can we connect entrepreneurs to the financing that they need to start their businesses? How can we connect the entrepreneurs to what's happening in the laboratories around our, our own region? Let's take a look at those three sectors. Let's look at the education sector, Look at the agriculture sector and healthcare sector. When we go to market, we say, what business will find this area attractive given those particular sectors? 
Jim said hey, we can take questions and answers, so I'm happy. That, that is my presentation, and I, uh, I appreciate your, your attention. Um, but I'm happy to take any questions from the audience. Sir. Yeah, WID is the uh, offshore wind industry, and Maryland's looking at do we construct an offshore wind farm off the coast of Ocean City um, to supply a percentage of their renewable sources. Um, it's been in development for about three or four years now, and um, what happens with the regulatory environment going forward, I, we don't know, but that's, that's what we're talking about. Uh, the drones is a Navy uh, drone program. Wallops Island is one of six FAA certified sites to, for testing drone and technologies. Um, and we're com competing against other uh, bases for that particular program. It's about 400 jobs. Um, I don't have a percentage, uh, Erica, on these, what, what the percentage is. Um, if anyone has one, we're, please, please, please uh, offer it up. But um, we're, start, we're, we're seeing, if you ride down Route 20, Route 24 in Sussex County, and in the Maryland side too, you'll see a, a substantial growth uh, responding to that market. But I don't have the exact percentage. I apologize. It's kind of all over the, map. The, the, the trend is this. They're, they're small pods, okay? It's not 100 of anything, and that's the challenge. We need five maintenance mechanics. We need four industrial electricians. We need lots of commercial truck drivers, a uh, certain number of registered nurses. So the models have changed in training too. Uh, how, do we, how do we train fewer people but for more specialized uh, occupations? And, and that, that's the challenge. Good question though. That's, uh, coming from a community college. Anything else? Well, I hope everyone has a great holiday and uh, thanks for having me today. Now it's my pleasure to invite up our next speaker. Our next speaker is Jimmy Ray, Special Secretary for the Governor's Office of Minority Affairs or GOMA if you talk uh, government speak. He was appointed by Governor Hogan in January of 2015 and is responsible for policy and oversight of Maryland's Minority Business Enterprise Program and Small Business Reserve Program. Before his current role, he was the strategic advisor for Livingston Group and a partner with EIGC Holdings. From 2010 through 14, he was Assistant Secretary of Commerce and Trade in Virginia, where he facilitated Virginia's Year of the Entrepreneur and worked to recognize the importance of minority communities in the state's economy. From 2003 through 2009, he served as CEO, COO of Global Technology Systems Consortium. He holds an MBA and a Master's of Science from Johns Hopkins and a Bachelor of Science from University of Maryland College Park, along with many professional certifications. Well, thank you so much. It's a tremendous honor for me to be here today and uh, <clears throat> to represent the governor's office. And I want to thank those who organized this wonderful and worthy event this morning. Thank you for all that you do. Um, I'm going to try to follow the, uh, well, my staff has guided me that I strictly follow the uh, PowerPoints because it's been somewhat busy last two weeks and we had very little time to uh, prepare, but I'm not much of a, a follow the PowerPoint type of guy. I'm going to try to go extemporaneously because um, I have a lot to share with you. But sometimes going extemporaneously is like, it's like having a baby. It's easy to conceive, but hard to deliver. Okay, So if I should mess it up, you know why. Uh, well, <clears throat> let me just brag about the Governor Hogan. Okay. Um, as you know, Governor Hogan is the 62nd governor of Maryland. He was a business person, so he understands thing or two about small business, the challenges that you face. And uh, the last two years, uh, he has passed 
two straight budgets with no tax increases. He's added over 72,000 jobs. That's the most created in 15 years. If you look back early uh, April this year, we created 19,000 jobs, and that was the most jobs created among all 50 states. So we are doing something right, and the governor deserves all the credit. Since last year, he's also reduced or eliminated over 250 fees and taxes. Now, it cost me $2 less to come here from Baltimore to Eastern Shore because there's a $2 reduction in toll, as you all know. And he has delivered nearly $700 million of total tax, toll, and fee relief to Maryland taxpayers. So he's doing a lot of things to improve Maryland, make Maryland a better place to live, work, and raise family. <coughs> You know, my GOMA, what is GOMA? Um, I didn't know what GOMA did, okay, when I was first appointed. Um, <clears throat> but now I, that I understand that we are primarily responsible for four different areas. One is we are responsible for administering something called MBE, which is Minority Business Enterprise. In Maryland, minority is uh, composed of anyone who is member of minority community, as well as women-owned businesses. And we are also um, in charge of overseeing something called SBR, which is Small Business Reserve. And that program is unique in that as long as you are a small business, only small business entities could become prime contractors in that space. And we also connect small business to international because of my past experience of overseeing international trade and investment governor has allowed me to connect international to small business community last year when governor went to asia the asia trade mission i was the person that organized the first half of the uh, asia trade mission so we connect small business uh, to international because we do live in this era called globalization where you gain economic strength by connecting interdependent parts and certainly small business could use some of that. And the fourth area that we are responsible for is business ombudsman. We have business ombudsman's office in our office. So if there's an issue with a small business, call us, okay? It's our job to fix it. This triangle represents the state of small business in Maryland. If you look at the apex, the top red part, that's where the public procurement takes place, all the government contracts. And relevant to my office, you have two groups there. One is called MBEs. There are 6,000 companies registered as Maryland Department of Transportation MDOT certified companies. Now, those companies, it's all about subcontracting. And then you have another 6,000 called Small Business Reserve that are registered. As I said earlier, small business reserve is all about prime contracting for small business. So in that apex, you have 12,000 companies competing. And I received reports from all 70 agencies that participate in those programs. So it's my job to monitor and implement those pro uh, programs effectively. Now below the apex, the much larger section of the triangle, that's the private sector. That's where you compete, most of you. And I have found out that there are more than 560,000 entities registered as small business in the state of Maryland. That's quite a few, okay? So it is my job to go out there and make sure that you are educated on what is happening in the state, and as well as focus on those attributes that I think is critical to your success, your corporate competency, access to funding, and your understanding of the government maze policies and things that impact you. Now, what are we doing to help, you help those small businesses? Well, from the governor's point of view, it's the governor's job to improve the forest so that all trees can receive sunlight, okay? So if I can sort of summarize, the three things that he focuses on is this. Number one is to improve the tax and fee structure. The second thing is improve the regular, regulatory structure. The regulations are not to impede what you do, but it should guide as far as what you are to do as business people. 
So, and the third is improving the physical infrastructure, whether it's fiber, whether it's rail, whether it's highway, because all those three things are essential for, for small business to compete in this era of globalization. So that's the thing that he does on a macro perspective. Now, we do have some mega projects in Maryland that you ought to know about. Many of these things, there will be a public contracts out there for small business to participate in. Some of the mega projects that you may be aware of is Port Covington, Under Armour, Trade Point Atlantic, the, the logistical point there, Marriott staying in Bethesda, FBI headquarters potentially coming to Maryland, Laurel or Largo, they could also go to Springfield, Virginia, okay? We don't know yet. Um, An Amazon fulfillment center is coming, the project core of Baltimore City, um, and of course, Ellicott City, the flood restoration work there. And then there are transportation projects that you may have heard, uh, the Purple Line, uh, the Howard Street Tunnel, uh, Watkins Mill, I-270 uh, interchange area, and of course, the MGM and MD-210 uh, area to expand that areas to reduce the uh, traffic congestion. Um, and then there are other improvements to Penn Stations and many other areas that potentially small business could participate. Earlier this year, governor established a commission to modernize the state's procurement system. It was chaired by the lieutenant governor, and I was one of the uh, co-chairs, and we recommended, there were 57 recommendations we submitted to the governor, and uh, basically the report is all about making the procurement process experience easier and simpler and more transparent for small business. So we focused on utilizing more modern technologies, simplifying the RFP process. We found that there are 70 different RFP, RFP templates so we want to consolidate that into a single, possibly two or three templates to make it simpler. Um, and of course, you could have a great system there, but then unless you have a trained professionals uh, implementing the system, the impact is absolutely zero. So we are really focused on training the people that are administering the pro procurement process. So we are trying, we're taking a holistic approach to improve the process so that the uh, market becomes easier, simpler, and transparent. It's that simple. <clears throat> now this here is not as, when we say internal recommendations, it's simply the things that we are requesting the state employees to focus on. Um, making things easier, focusing on training, as I said earlier. On a micro level, let me tell you what we do, okay? Now, governor's passion, his commitment to small business, really is second to none, okay? He truly understands the uh, positive impact that small businesses have on overall e Maryland's economy. Now, I think it was Emerson who said, organization is merely an extended shadow of his leader, right? My office is no exception. We're out there every day implementing the governor's vision. So my focus is to be out there, do a lot of outreach programs, and focus on three areas that I think is critically important for small business to have in order to succeed. And one is enhancing corporate competency. Because if you're not really good at what you do, if you're not best at what you do, well, you're gonna compete in price. And there's a miserable place to be because there's always somebody cheaper than cheaper than you. And second thing is access to capital. Money to business is like blood to our body. Doesn't matter how good you are. If you don't have money, you cannot sustain your gain. So access to capital is an important issue that we try to address. Of course, third thing that we do is we want to make sure that you understand, you have an insightful understanding of certain policies that impact your eco space or your company. Because if you don't understand the policies, you don't really know, the, you don't really know what the opportunities are, okay? I'll give you one example of connecting these three pillars of success. When I was 
uh, focused on doing international trade and investment, I was trying to recruit a very large Asian company to establish presence. And they produced LED lighting kits, okay? They wanted to sell the kits in the US federal space. Very difficult thing to do, okay? Foreign company, manufacture someplace else. So we're not fools, okay? Um, but that's what they did, and they failed. So the CEO came to me, help us, okay? So I told the CEO, among three things, you have two, I have one. Number one, you have corporate competency. Your stuff's pretty good, okay? Very good product, okay? <clears throat> and this is an Asian company that you probably have heard of before. Um, very large company, $150 billion a year revenue, okay? Huge uh, company. So your stuff's pretty good. So you have corporate competency. And two, you have a lot of money, okay? You've been doing this for the past three years. Mistakes, but you could sustain your game, okay? So you have money. But you don't have that insightful understanding of certain policies that could provide you with the opportunities. So I suggested that, why don't you give me your product, perhaps 70% manufacture, and let me do the last 30% here. But I'll bring in handicapped people, because these are hard to employ people. When they touch your product, your product becomes Made in USA certified. Perhaps it could become mandatory purchase item for certain federal facilities, okay? Because we have a special policies to help this group. So it's not just a matter of buying and selling bilateral relationship. In the era of globalization, you create this X factor, you satisfy that variable, and party happens. So it's more of a triangulation rather than buy a bilateral relationship. So that's the way we have to think. And I think all small businesses have to think that way going forward. Now let me explain the programs that I earlier alluded to, uh, MBE and uh, S SBR program. MBE is a program that we all know. It's been there since, um, I believe, a civil rights movement in 1978. Um, and MBE is all about subcontracting. You have to become certified by MDOT. And <clears throat> right now, there are 70 agencies participating an MBE program. Last year, we awarded close to um, $3 billion under this program. And uh, its impact on Maryland is quite huge. We either maintain or uh, created 34,000 jobs. So it's a big program. And MBE, as I said, is a race and gender-based program. And that's the difference there, race and gender-based program. Whereas SBR is where small business could become prime contractors. Um, only small business can become prime contractors. Right now, 23 largest agencies participate in the SBR program. But among the 57 recommendations that we made and submitted to the governor, uh, we suggested that we expand the program to 70 agencies and increase the uh, goal under SBR from currently uh, set at 10% to 15%. So there is a greater um, business opportunity for small business. When I first came on uh, and uh, looked at the uh, state's procurement, I found out something that was alarming, and that was simply this. In the MBE space and both SBR space, uh, there are close to 6,000 companies participating in each of those two sectors. And I looked at how much business do top 200 companies take from the total pool from each sector respectively. I found out in the MBE space, top 200 companies take close to 75% of the business. So I told the governor, hey, we have stagnant pool here. We're going to have to break it up, make it more like a flowing river, okay? And that's what we're trying to do, okay? 200 companies among 6,000 taking more than 75% of the business is not what I call a fair program, okay? Uh, so we have to make the program much more equitable. But in order to do that, we have to also enhance the corp corporate competency, the competency level of small businesses so that there's a confidence among prime contractors to utilize small companies. So it's a holistic approach that we have to take. We understand what the problems are, 
Now we're doing something about it with, through this procurement modernization committee, and that's what we're trying to do. Make sure that government contracting is not giving out government contracts to people that we love. This is a tool with which we do economic development. Okay, this is your money, it's not our money. And you deserve a spot on the table, so that's the way we look at it. No, let me just, I'm terrible following the PowerPoints. Let me just go extemporaneously, okay? Look, as a small business, you got a lot of things to worry about, okay? And yet, the problems are good to have because problems, if you don't have a problem, you have a problem, okay? Businesses exist to solve problems, so problems are good. But, and there's no better time to be in business than right now. There is something called globalization that's taking place. If you look at it, the world is very crowded, okay? You got seven billion people living on the planet. And only about 5% of those seven billion live in the US. That means 95% 95 of your market is out there, outside of this country. For those of you who are old enough, you remember when Soviet Union collapsed, USSR? You had a whole bunch of people who worked on that side of the fence and join the main economic stream on this side, okay? Perhaps 1.2 billion people coming to this side at wages perhaps 90% or lower. So, of course, competition intensified. And we're not even talking about BRIC nations, entry of China or India. They probably joined the global labor force at wages 9,000% or lower. So no wonder jobs are scarce. But is that the way to look at it? Not really, because labor force does not just produce, they consume as well. You've got, a greater labor, you've got a greater market out there that you can sell your products and services. Second, world is much smaller because of technology, right? Click of mouse, you can communicate, and conduct business with people all over the world, 24 seven. A single web page makes you instantly and globally relevant. That's the new world. And technology also makes you much more competitive, efficient, right? You're from your office process, warehouse, sales, whatever it is that you do because of technology, you are much more efficient. But not just you, your competitors are just as competitive. So competition intensifies, okay? And just as price, just as water seeks the lowest ground, or well, purchasing money, smart purchasing money especially, seeks the lowest price. The price and competition is intense out there, and you all know that. So is it bad for small business? Not necessarily, because if you're the most efficient player in your sector, even in your neighborhood, a buyer somewhere will find you because we are all connected. And of course, the world is changing. Think about that. We have Google. You can find out anything you want and compete. If you live in China, they have their own version of Google called Baidu. They do exactly the same thing. All the information is there. Click up mouse, okay? So everything's much more competitive. Look back to Henry Ford's days. Assembly line, massive labor force, producing cars cheaper and faster. Well, they created a lot of jobs back then, and they transformed the automobile which was once considered as rich people's toy into a mass transport, right? That helped everybody. But today, young people, young entrepreneurs are doing the same thing to services, what Henry Ford did to production, and creating this economy called on-demand economy. They're combining technology and freelance to deliver certain services that were once reserved for rich people only. Think about Uber, Lyft. But via chauffeur, right? Think about handy. They come wash your, they come clean your house. Or wash your, they come wash your clothes. Spoon rocket. They deliver restaurant quality meals to your doorsteps. There are many companies like those. On demand economy. And this on demand economy is growing very fast. And why is it called on demand? Because you only, need, you only use it when you need it. Uber drivers, they don't get paid until, unless they drive, okay? And why is it so unique? Because it's all about hyper-specialization of your services. 
But more importantly, it's about tapping into underutilized capacity in our society. For those of you with kids, your kids grow up, they go to college and go, go off independently. So you now have a spare empty bedrooms. But well, that's underutilized capacity, isn't it? You're not using those bedrooms. But through Airbnb, you can convert those rooms into hotel rooms. I use Airbnb all the time when I travel globally, okay? It's all about utilizing the underutilized capacity in our society. The economy that Henry Ford built, well, it's been withering away since the 70s. Automation kills jobs. Outsourcing sends jobs away to someplace cheaper. There's no more lifetime employment. Believe it or not, you have more than 55 million American workers today working as freelancers. So why is this thing happening? Well, first thing is because of cheap computing. Computers are cheap. A high school kid can, with his own PC, create videos that could rival the quality of Hollywood, okay? We all have this, right? I got three of these things. Um, at home, I got my wife, my second wife, third wife, and fourth wife. Outside, this is my first, second, third, and she's the fourth, okay? Uh, now, these things connect us globally 24-7. This is how Uber get you to rent out your cars, okay, which otherwise would be parked in garage somewhere 95% of the time, underutilized capacity. Even the big companies are joining in the fray because they are now hiring outsiders to come up with solutions for their R&D problems or come up with better advertising ideas. In essence, what they are doing is, do you have a spare brain capacity that I can rent? That's what's happening, okay? And secondly, these days, especially because of these things, we are so busy, okay? I look at these things 10,000 times a day. So it seems like people with money have no time. People with time, they have no money. So on-demand economy connects these two groups to trade with each other, which is a good thing. Which is a good thing. But ultimately, on-demand economy companies would have to follow the footsteps of the manufacturers in the past. And that's to focus on their core competency. And the reason? So the transaction cost of delivering a solution by hiring outsiders will continue to be cheaper than keeping that function inside the company. So who benefits? You, the consumers. What about the business people? Oh, it's more challenging now, okay? You now have to master multiple skills just to stay even, just to compete. To some extent, you have to become much more self-reliant. You have to become an Uber of X whatever that X might be that you're good at. This is a new world, okay? If you value job security, well, I'm sorry, okay? On-demand economy is a threat to you, right? It's a new world. So this globalization is real. Someone once said that globalization is like a Darwinism of capitalism on steroids. If you don't change, if you don't adapt quickly, you perish, it's that simple. Reminds of us what Einstein had said to us. The greatest insanity is doing the same thing over and over again, expecting different results. But that cannot be in this era of globalization. As business people, you have two very simple rules. One, what can be done will get done because we have technology. The real question is, would it get done by you or would it get done to you? That's it's that simple, okay? If, if you have a great idea, you better take action on it immediately. Because if you don't take action on your idea immediately, somebody probably, probably the other side of the Pacific is taking action on that very same idea in this instant, okay? And second is the greatest competition. It's not among countries or corporations. It's between you and your great idea. Think about this, because of technology and connectivity, you can really take your idea farther, cheaper, better than any time before. If you have a great idea, think about this. You don't even need physical facility. You can take your idea to Korea or Taiwan for design. Take it to Vietnam or China for manufacturing. And take it to Amazon.com for delivery. 
And if you make a lot of money, you can hire an accountant through Craigslist. Everything there commoditized, competing in price, except your idea. That's the only one that's unique, that holds value. And this is a new world that you live in. So uh, this is something for us to think about for when we enhance small business competency. But I do know one thing. There's no better group of people than small business people with a strong will to succeed. And I'm very optimistic that the small business will continue to be successful in the U.S. And I'm also talking to a lot of policymakers. When we talk about small business, let's break them into two groups. Number one, you have small business groups that create a lot of jobs, okay? When politicians talk about small business entities create 45% of net new jobs, they are talking about this small group here. These are the future Airbnbs, future uh, <coughs> Ubers of the world. They receive their money from venture capital, equity-based money. They are there to disrupt the space. And the other side of the small group, these are the small business that you and I typically talk about, the restaurant owners, okay? Dry cleaning shops, the small business that are out there, well, they don't really create a lot of jobs. Their focus is to stay alive, stay viable. They get their money, which is debt-based money, from traditional banks, loans they have to pay back. These are two different groups, and we cannot lump them together, have a one-size-fits-all policy to impact positively, okay? We have to have a two different policies because these are two different groups. So depending on which side you fall, well, that's what you're going to have to talk to your congressmen and your delegates to make sure that they understand the same. But anyway, I want to thank you for this opportunity and best of luck to you. Thank you.